Hey everybody, this is Aubrey Chavez from Faith Matters. This week we brought on journalist McKay Coppins and historian Patrick Mason to examine the seven-part series Under the Banner of Heaven that recently aired on Hulu. It's a dramatized crime series about the horrific 1984 murders of Brenda and Erica Lafferty by brothers Ron and Dan Lafferty. Like the book it's based on, the series paints a very grim portrait of Latter-day Saint faith and culture and has been both praised and panned by critics. In the conversation, McKay and Patrick help us explore why that is and discuss the validity of John Krakauer's fundamental thesis that religion and violence go hand in hand. McKay Coppins is a staff writer for The Atlantic who writes frequently about faith and politics. He published a superb piece about the series at the request of his editor at the magazine. We'll link to that article in our show notes. And many of you know Patrick, but very briefly, Patrick is the Leonard Arrington Chair of Mormon History and Culture at Utah State University. And he's also a frequent and valued guest on this show and advisor to Faith Matters. Tim and I were actually traveling and unavailable to host this episode, so we thank Bill Turnbull, Faith Matters co-founder, for filling in on this one for us. And with that, we'll jump right in. So welcome back, McKay Coppins and Patrick Mason to the Faith Matters podcast. Thanks, Bill. Good to be on. Good to see you too. Uh, we are talking about the uh, Hulu series Under the Banner of Heaven. Um, we've come to this conversation a bit reluctantly. I think McKay... Um, wrote a piece, a wonderful piece in The Atlantic, actually, and uh, and explained why it, he came to it a bit reluctantly as well. Um, my viewing of it, I was sort of compelled to to watch it. Um, it was, I, I can imagine that it was entertaining. It, to me, it, it seemed a bit uh, transparently cartoonish depiction of, of uh, Mormonism in Utah in the 1980s, because I was here in the 1980s. I'm like, you guys, I'm the, the elder statesman in the room. I didn't, re- I, did, I didn't recognize the language and the kind of behavior. It also seemed to have been written with, with quite a, um, you know, sort of a transparent agenda. But um, so, but apparently it has uh, gained some influence. And so it's something that, that uh, we probably should talk about. So if you guys are up for that, let's do it. How, what's your sense of how of the influence that the that the series has had before we dive into it? Is it done well? I mean, it's so it's interesting in this era of like streaming TV. I think that it's always hard to measure the reach a show has because we don't go by the old Nielsen rating system that we used to. Um, <clears throat> I will say that uh, you know the metrics we can rely on. It has gotten very favorable reviews. I would say, you know, borderline rave reviews from TV critics. Uh, It's been widely covered in the kind of mainstream press and and the sort of publications that cover shows like this. Um, And I would say, you know, anecdotally, a a lot of the people in my life, which is, you know, I I live in my own little bubble of (laughs) East Coast uh, media, I guess. Uh, a lot of people were watching it um, just kind of out of curiosity or because they like like the true crime genre. Uh, There have been reports that it's going to uh, be in the Emmys conversation. Um, And so, you know, my sense is that the show is, you know, not like a Da Vinci Code level phenomenon, but uh, certainly, uh, you know, widely viewed and widely talked about in certain sectors of American society. And I think, you know, as such is probably shaping perceptions of Mormonism in certain quarters. I know that that's true, at least from a lot of the people that I know and have talked to. Yeah. So although a Latter-day Saint might have a difficult time seeing him or herself in this uh, story, um, if, if you don't have that kind of background, you might assume that this is an accurate depiction of what uh, of events and and the culture. So, uh, Patrick, could you could you give us a little bit of framing here for those who don't know what the original what, what the original event was, and then the book that came out of that, and uh, and then we'll get into the series. Yeah. So, real briefly, the the series uh, and then the book that it's based on focus on the murder of Brenda Wright Lafferty and her 15 month old daughter by a gruesome murder. Uh, by a couple of brothers, Ron and Dan Lafferty. Uh, So this was in uh, Utah in the summer of 1984. And Ron and Dan Lafferty uh, were raised in the mainstream LDS church. 
Uh, but uh, over time, it's, it's a bit of a complicated story. Uh, but long story short, they uh, they sort of radicalized. They became uh, they encountered uh, fundamentalist uh, teachings uh, and and figures, and they they came to believe that um, they were called to uh, set the church in order, as uh, as is true for many other fundamentalists. Uh, they began receiving revelations, uh, Ron in particular, and one of these revelations was known as the removal revelation in which they needed to uh, remove, they, they believed that God told them to remove a number of people who were getting in their way, getting in the way of their mission. And that began with their sister-in-law, Brenda, um, uh, it included a number of other people who were on the, the, the list. Fortunately, uh, the, the, the two were apprehended um, before they were able to kill anybody else. Uh, but yet, just a, a horrible, gruesome murder that, that has its roots. Uh, you know, they were certainly using the grammar and vocabulary of Mormonism. Uh, it's more complicated than that, but, uh, but, but that was the kind of framework that they were working within when they committed these murders. And the, uh, the book, the, the Krakauer book, yeah, so the murders are in 1984, uh, and I think you know they were covered widely in the media at the time, but uh, but then I think largely um, you know lapsed in the popular consciousness until um, the early 21st century. So right after 9/11, uh, uh, everybody was interested in religion and violence. Everybody was talking about it in in the wake of the the terrorist attacks, uh, and so John Krakauer, uh, really successful, really fine uh, journalist and author. Uh, he set out to write a book about religion and violence, and uh, he says that he kind of just stumbled upon this story, stumbled upon the Lafferty murders, upon fundamentalist Mormonism, uh, and then situated within the longer history of, of Mormonism, which of course isn't that long. Uh, so he was able, able to tell a story about 19th to, to, to late 20th century Mormonism and uh, published the book. Uh, I think it came out in 2002 or, or something like that. Uh, and it is by far the number one best-selling book about Mormonism in this century. Uh, I, I don't have exact sales numbers, but if you look at the Amazon rankings, and I check those uh, fairly often, mostly out of vanity, um, but, uh, but, but Krakauer has, has been number one or in the top five consistently for 20 years ever since the book uh, was published. So mm -hmm. I would say that you know, however many people are watching this show, Add that to the number of people who have uh, read Crack Hour, and these may be the kind of two, uh, and maybe along with the Book of Mormon musical, uh, the, the the main touch points for the popular culture in in terms of like seeing Mormonism. Mm -hmm. Just as and like the, a data, just as if I can jump in, just as a data point to underscore how influential that book was. I remember that when I was a reporter covering the 2012 presidential campaign, a number of people in the media, reporters, journalists, people I knew, uh, decided that they needed to learn about Mormonism because Mitt Romney was the Republican presidential nominee and went out and bought that book. Like they, they would Google, you know, books to learn about Mormonism or whatever under the banner of heaven would, you know, be recommended to them, and and a number of people were reading that as kind of the definitive text on Mormonism, how to understand the Mormon faith. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's true for my non-LDS colleagues here at the university, most of whom come from out of state. They say when they got hired uh, and moved to Utah, either they picked up that book or somebody gave them that book as like life, you know, your, your guide to life in the state of Utah. <laughs> I have a cousin that lives in the Hudson River Valley, an artist, um, and she got very interested in family history, her religious background, she's Buddhist, but she she got in, interested in family history and came to visit us here. So, and we we took her to the conference, a delightful woman. And and the only thing she had known about uh, about our church uh, up until that day was what she had read in Under the Banner of Heaven. So um, yeah, it's, it had quite an impact. And uh, is it fair to say that uh, Krakauer did not have a friendly uh, perspective uh, toward religion and its role in society. I think that's fair to say. <laughs> <laughs> I think Krakauer himself would probably acknowledge that. I, mean, I will say that the interesting thing about that book is that he has said in interviews that he set out to write a book about religious violence in the wake of 9-11. Right. Uh, but he didn't want to write about Islamic violence. And so he went and found this story. And in some ways, you know, as a writer and journalist myself, like, the, the, there's always danger in 
going to look for a story to illustrate a thesis that you've already settled on, which is what he, he you know, very transparently set out to do. Um, and so his book was, yes, a kind of indictment of Mormonism, but also an indictment of religious faith in general, um, and kind of a, a, a shadow indictment of, of radical Islam in particular. Um, and, and so that's kind of the context of this book's uh, publication. Mm. And so the next, the next thing that the uh, immediate cause for our conversation was this series, that seven part series that Hulu uh, just aired. And um, it certainly doesn't um, deviate from that uh, suspicion of religion and particularly our religion. Um, but tell us, tell us a little bit, a bit about the series. Uh, McKay, you wrote a piece in the Atlantic, by the way, I should, maybe for some of our younger viewers who don't understand or don't appreciate the illustrious history of the Atlantic magazine. Um, <laughs> I, I believe it wasn't it founded pre-Civil War and uh, Emerson and Longfellow and others. That was a quite a, it has yeah, quite a it history. Was, it founded as an abolitionist magazine in the run-up to the Civil War um, that was devoted to exploring and championing the American experiment and in all its various manifestations. Um, and yes, it has, has an illustrious history that uh, the, my colleagues and editors love to talk about. Um, and, uh, you know, it, but, but it is a genuinely a, a pretty interesting place and um, it, an interesting publication in particular to spend time in the archives of. Um, its coverage of early Mormonism, in fact, is pretty fascinating and I think might inform some of our conversation here today. Um, you, typically but, write, you typically write about politics and current events, so this isn't your, um, yeah. Yeah, no, I, 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 you know, my main beat for most of my career has been politics. And then um, in the, the last couple of years, I've started to branch out into other, uh, other areas of interest. Um, my, I, and I've written about Mormonism just in the last couple of years from a more personal standpoint, uh, in part because, uh, you know, I, my, my editors have kind of encouraged it. But, you know, it, it's funny you mentioned that we, we came to this conversation a bit reluctantly. I came to Under the Banner of Heaven and to writing about it pretty reluctantly as I write in my piece, which you can go read on The Atlantic. But I, I had planned to just ignore the series because I was familiar with the book. I kind of had a pretty good idea, I thought, of the arguments that, that the book made and what the show would make and didn't really feel a need to watch it. Um, I'm currently deep at work on, on some other writing projects and figured oh, I'll just tune it out. Uh, but the editor, uh, my, my boss at The Atlantic started watching the show and, uh, and texted me uh, after watching, I think the first couple episodes and his, his exact text was under the banner of heaven, yeesh. <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and then a follow-up text saying, imagine making a show about the, about any other religion like this, which we'll, we'll, I'll return to that idea in a second. But uh, he, he was really the one who said, like, you, you should watch this show. It's pretty wild. And I'd be interested to hear what you think about it. So I, I ended up watching it basically as an assignment uh, at the Atlantic. Um, you know, the series uh, is, it's coming out almost 20 years after the book was published. And um, you know, the book being such a phenomenon, being so widely read, kind of uh, meant that it was always in the conversation about being adapted for the screen. Uh, there was a period where it was going to become a film. That didn't happen. Then it was, uh, it was adapted finally for TV by Dustin Lance Black, who is a kind of celebrated screenwriter. He uh, won an Oscar for uh, his screenplay uh, for the film Milk, which is a Harvey Milk biopic. Um, he is, uh, he grew up in the, in the church. Um, he uh, left, left the church as a young man for a variety of reasons, including, uh, you know, his, the homophobia he experienced and uh, other, other issues that he's talked about at length. Um, and it's interesting because he, his, his framing of the series is to essentially take the story at the heart of Under the Banner of Heaven, the story of these murders, um, and then to fictionalize it in a way that is essentially, uh, he invents a main character, which is a, an orthodox 
active Latter-day Saint detective who is investigating these murders, played by Andrew Garfield, um, and who eventually loses his faith as he explores these murders and the, the fundamentalist roots of the murders. Um, I, I will pause to say here that I, I didn't spend a lot of time in my piece talking about the, uh, the kind of artistic merit of the show, uh, but, but I will just say other critics have noted that um, it's pretty clunkily written in parts. Now it's a it's a compelling show, you know, show, and the story is kind of grimly compelling. But it's very clear if you start watching it. I, at least from my perspective, I'd be here interested to hear if Patrick disagrees. But it's clear that Dustin Lance Black kind of has a, a an argument that he wants to advance, a thesis he wants to advance, which is set forth in the very first episode of the show when a character. Uh, is is confronting this Latter-day Saint detective and tells him, if you still believe that your God is love, then you don't know who you are, brother. Uh, and then he, he says, this faith, our faith, uh, breeds dangerous men. And that, it, that ends up being the thesis for the entire show. Uh, that, those words he put in the mouth of Alan, the brother mm -hmm. of the Lafferty's, right? Whose yeah. wife and daughter had been murdered uh yeah so that that's in the first few minutes of the show that lays out the theme well, yeah so and, and and right and you know the the thing about the show is that for the rest of the series it toggles back and forth between the investigation of these murders um and then various historical fla flashbacks to early mormonism um where to basically to make the case that the actions of these murderous extremists are rooted in the the history of the Mormon tradition, and uh, you know by the end of the show, the the thesis is made pretty clear that these men were uh, were just following their religion when they committed these murders. That is, that is the argument, and actually, it even goes a step further in the final episode, where one character who's supposed to sort of be the audience avatar, it's kind of it's the non Mormon character. Uh, the, uh, another detective actually uh, says, you know, um, that 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 the Mormon detective has helped create these monsters with all of his good Mormon testimony bearing. Mm -hmm. The the premise being that uh, any modern mainstream Mormon, regardless of how nonviolent and uh, and normal they are, bear some responsibility for the actions of these extremists. And so, as you can imagine, it's a fairly hostile show with a very provocative thesis. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm just going to read from your piece. You say, you write, under the banner of heaven is one of the most openly hostile treatments of a minority religious group to appear in popular American entertainment this century. Uh, Patrick, is that it? Is that, did, did McKay overstate that? Well, uh, I haven't consumed all of American popular culture uh, in this century. I mean, I, I do note that, I don't, I don't know if it's just me, you know, the algorithms, uh, uh, but, but when I look, you know, when I log into Netflix or something like that, I seem to get a lot of shows about religion uh, and not very many of them are friendly. Uh, a lot of shows about people leaving religion, a lot of focus on, you know, very conservative or orthodox religion, you know, a lot of focus on orthodox Judaism or fundamentalism. There are other shows right now about Mormonism. So, so th there does seem to be a, a, a kind of uh, a genre, but this, you know, I, so I, I don't know where I would rank this, uh, but, but, there, but there's no doubt that uh, it's a thesis driven show that is openly hostile to the to the religion. And I and I don't think that we are besmirching the intent of the creators when we say that, because Dustin Lance Black himself has talked about the negative experiences he had with Mormonism, both growing up, uh, but then also uh, as a gay man fighting for marriage equality in California uh, in 2008, where he saw the, the LDS church do uh, basically a full frontal assault on, on marriage rights in, in his view. And uh, and so so he has talked about the need for the LDS church to, to go through serious reformation uh, and a kind of serious reckoning. So um, I don't well, know if he would use the word hostile, but, uh, but, but, but certainly he's, he doesn't have a lot of warm and fuzzy feelings uh, towards the institutional church. 
Right. We talk a little bit about the uh, artistic merit of the film, and I don't think that should drive the conversation because that's a matter of taste, obviously. But um, but what are the, what are some of the problems with the film? Um, let's say where it plays fast and loose with some facts, or uh, tells or fabricates uh, new narratives. Yeah, I mean, cer certainly, even even the the main you know topic itself, the Lafferty murders. Uh, Black has said many times he he didn't set out to make a documentary, and so you know the main character is fictionalized. Uh, a lot of names are changed. There's composite characters. Obviously, most of the dialogue is made up. I mean, that's that's what you expect with a kind of uh, dramatized version, even if it's kind of quote unquote based on on history. Uh, and I don't think in that sense it's any worse than any other kind of movie or TV show. Um, it, is, it is a little confusing, though, that device that he used of creating these two detectives and particularly the one that's like trying to get to this. So they they're fictional characters injected into a uh, you know, into an historical event. And it's I, I would imagine for most viewers, it'd be hard to tease apart the difference of, you know, where's where's reality? Where does fact meet fiction here? Uh, just because they don't have. Uh, you know, a fundamental understanding of the thing in the first place. So they're going to take this as an as one piece, uh, as one story, I would imagine. Yeah, and I think that's the, you know, um, I love movies based on history, but that al always is the danger. And, you know, writers and, and producers and directors have to make those kinds of choices to make them compelling and, and to create storylines. So I think as viewers, the responsibility is on us to watch critically and then do our research. Uh, to, to to figure things out because they're not going to put a little caveat at the bottom of the screen every time it's not actually historical. Um, but but there are some real issues with the actual history, as McKay said, with these historical flashbacks. Um, a, a lot of them are fine in terms of they're, they're based in good documentary evidence. Uh, they're ob he's obviously choosing the most unflattering aspects of LDS history to focus on. Um, but uh, but some of them, I think, are just flat out wrong. Uh, the uh, there are uh, episodes, I think it's episode five. I could be wrong about that, that that focuses on Joseph Smith's murder and it portrays Brigham Young and John Taylor as part of a conspiracy of senior leaders of the church who want to get rid of Joseph Smith so that they can continue to practice polygamy. It kind of suggests that Joseph is kind of having some second thoughts about it. Uh, and so uh, so Young and Taylor uh, want to get rid of him uh, and invent you know, or, or alter communications from Emma to, to Joseph to basically set him up uh, so that he will go to Carthage and be killed. Uh, I don't know of any uh, serious professional historian. I, I actually don't even know where that comes from, frankly. Um, it, it serves certain kinds of narratives about Joseph Smith not really being a polygamist and really blaming it all on Brigham. Um, I don't know that it's based on any historical evidence. I, I honestly don't know where that comes from. And then it also claims that Brigham Young orchestrated the Mountain Meadows Massacre. Now, that's that's something that um, historians have debated for a long time. Uh, Will Bagley, in his book about Mountain Meadows, he basically lays the blame at Brigham Young's feet. Most historians now, uh, both LDS and non-LDS, don't agree with that. Uh, that they, they believe that the evidence points pretty compellingly towards the fact that Brigham did not orchestrate it and he would have stopped it if he could. He helped create the culture in which it was possible. And I think that's something that we can talk about. Um, but but the, the series shows him directly authorizing, even commanding it. Um, and, uh, and most historians just wouldn't agree with that. Okay. Any other issues? I, there were some rather dark de depictions of uh, top church leaders involved <laughs> in this process with the Lafferty's. It was... Interesting. I I, <laughs> I I I hesitate to laugh, but I mean, the, it's funny. As I was watching the show, I was kind of binging the show because I had to write about it fairly quickly, and so it, it, over the course of two days, I watched all seven episodes, and I was taking videos of the most kind of outrageous, cartoonish parts and texting them to a couple of friends uh, who had not watched the show, and and they they mostly centered on the general authorities who were depicted in the show because they were i mean they're literally like scooby-doo villains yeah in this show. <laughs> like they 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 show up at the you know police department and make like 
incredibly outrageous threats to the detectives, um, ordering them essentially to cover up the murders or at least to uh, steer away from the fundamentalist uh, motivation of the murders for reasons that are not entirely clear in the show. Um, at one point, one of the, the church leaders dusts his feet off as he leaves the, the uh, <laughs> leaves the police station as a kind of a condemnation. I mean, it's really kind of incredibly, uh, uh, you know, villainous and, and and to the point where it actually kind of took me out of the show because it was so ridiculous that it, it kind of made me laugh. Um, but you know, again, this is this is where this show suffers. It felt like Dustin Lance Black was trying to cram in every creepy seeming or weird seeming thing about Mormon history or practice or culture that he could, mm -hmm. um, often to the detriment of the narrative and and its you know verisimilitude. Um, you know, the other thing I would say is there's there's a lot of um, just kind of passing comments on on you know Mormon culture. Um, that, that like, you know, maybe are not the most important things, but I write about one of them that, uh, you know, every single uh, Latter-day Saint character in this show uses the term heavenly father in almost every sentence that they utter. Um, you know, it'll <laughs> like, like it's it, good it, to be it, hilarious actually. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I tried to capture some of the most ridiculous ones. I, I tried to write down every time that it happened and finally gave up because there were just way too many. Um, and, and I brought that up in the piece and be, not because it's the most egregious thing that the show does, but because it, it felt like representative of the show's uh, tendency to try to exoticize Mormonism rather than capture its texture, right? Mm -hmm. There is a version of this show that still essentially advances the crack hour thesis that Mormonism and organized religion in general are to blame for this violence. And, you know, let's be clear that that's an argument that's been happening in human history for centuries, right? How much is religion to blame for, uh, you know, atrocities committed in the name of religion? Um, but there's a version of this show that advances that idea while trying to, you know, humanely capture Mormon life. Um, and that's not this show. At every single moment of Mormon life that's depicted um, with maybe a couple exceptions is depicted as being sinister, right? Okay. Even things as simple as a child saying a prayer or a family dinner or family reunion, you know, everything is depicted as sinister and scary and they use all the tools at their disposal, you know, the creepy score and uh, the way the shots are, are, are set up to make Mormon life in all of its manifestations, not just in the fundamentalist manifestations, as scary as possible. Um, they all, and the other thing I would say about this show, and, and this is where I would actually be curious, Bill, since you, uh, you know, apparently yeah. were, were in Utah in the 80s, um, you know, they depict this family at the center of the show, the Lafferty family, um, as the Kennedys of Utah, which I think is uh, has been documented as clearly not true. The Lafferty that, that may be Utah. that may be the most laughable part of the show. Yeah, right. Yeah, I mean these these guys were. Uh, I mean, it was a family that struggled seemingly with mental illness, um, to dysfunction of very various forms, and uh, and and I I mean yeah I lived. Basically, I've lived here in Utah County during that time. I'd never heard of them until the murder. And I don't think most people had. They had a moderately successful chiropractic practice, I think. Um, uh, I do know I do know people who did know the Lafferty's. Uh, they were actually friends of, of Dan and Ron. And that's another story. Um, but yeah, that, yeah the, the, the point is, the point is, I just said yeah. there are a handful of names that you see on every building in Utah. Uh, and Lafferty isn't one of them. We want to, no, not one of them. Right. It's not that there aren't, there are Kennedys of Utah. It, it, it's not, it, it's not them. It's not as if this was happening with the Huntsmans, for example, or something like that. The, what I would say though, is it does serve an important narrative purpose in the show because we're meant to see the Lafferty family in all its kind of dysfunction and violence and, um, and, you know, kind of uh, extremely stern practice of Mormon faith 
as representative of mainstream Mormonism, at least as, as it was practiced in the 1980s in Utah County. Um, and I'm not sure that that's true, um, but, but the way that the show sets them up as kind of an ideal Mormon family, um, it, it's important because then the show's conceit is that even this ideal Mormon family clearly had, you know, was shadowy and scary and their descent into extremism and radicalization uh, was was much easier than you might imagine. Right. Which again, and I, I want to, you know, I'm curious about Patrick's thoughts on this. Like, it does get at this insidious idea that's existed for a long time, and Patrick's written about it extensively about Mormons as fundamentally threatening to the American project, right? As uh, as a a kind of frightening other that needs to be feared, and, and I think that is more than anything the show's project. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, in a lot of ways, for, for me, one of the reasons the show didn't work just from a kind of narrative perspective is, is um, there's no descent into madness because it's madness all the, all the way through. Right. Um, it's, it's actually not all that interesting to, to, to see what happens to these characters because it's, it's all dark and sinister and ominous from the, from the beginning. Uh, and and for me, at least, stories are more interesting when when there actually is a fall from grace, or when there, when there actually is uh, a descent. Clearly, they change from from uh, episodes one to episode seven, but but they're really just living out what was there all along. That is the thesis of the show. And and for me, you know, um, again, I, I don't really care whether or not people like it or don't like it. Uh, it's just an aesthetic judgment. But, but for me, as I've talked with a lot of people, what I see is that the series serves as a kind of Rorschach test, that if you have been hurt or wounded by organized religion or have some reason to be suspicious of it, um, you, this show will resonate with you. Even if you recognize that many of the elements are exaggerated, uh, that, the, that the conversations are clunky, that sort of everything that the, the, the begins and, and sort of rings true, then goes even further uh, and, and is somewhat heavy handed. At least it'll resonate with you. Uh, and I've talked with a lot of people like this um, uh, still today uh, who, who say, yeah, I recognize, you know, the priesthood leaders aren't exactly like that. But let me tell you about my interactions with priesthood leaders. And it's kind of like that. Uh, but if you've ever seen or experienced Mormonism or organized religion as a kind of positive force for good, even recognizing the challenges that, that no community is perfect, certainly Mormonism isn't, then it's not going to resonate with you. So I, I, I think the show, um, look, the three of us, most people who are listening to Faith Matters, that's not the target audience for this show. Uh, and, and so it's telling a different story for a different audience. And I have to say, one of my disappointments with the show um, you know, Black, Dustin Lance Black, um, at the premiere in lots of media, he said he wanted this to be a conversation starter. Uh, it does not um, succeed, in my view, be precisely because it's so thesis driven, because th this show doesn't ask any questions. It, it comes to the viewer with all of the answers, uh, and it beats you over the head over and over and over again. And so, um, so it doesn't, I, I think there are conversations that need to be had. I think there need to be conversations about the patriarchy that's built within Mormon history and culture, about the, the violence in our scriptures, um, you know, about the challenges of listening to the small, still small voice, you know, when, when God, you know, speaks to you, what is that voice in your head? What are the guardrails on that? Those are all really important conversations to have. Um, unfortunately, for for me at least the series didn't leave a lot of space to 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 have those conversations there are elements of of mormon history that are are totally fair to have a discussions about about uh you know what 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 those the lasting remnants of those traditions are in our current culture and how we should explore them and treat them this show doesn't have any interest in starting the conversation though i will to your uh to your point bill like say if, if we wanted to create the space right here in the kind of final minutes of this conversation uh, for an actual exploration of the ideas that the show brings up, there were things, there were criticisms uh, in this show that that did feel real to me. You know, um, the the racism that this Native American non-Mormon detective encounters, uh, where he's frequently referred to as a Lamanite and treated as distrustful, or you know, uh, met with a lot of distrust by people in Utah County. 
I imagine that that is not that far off from probably how some Native American, uh, especially non-Mormon Native Americans might have felt in Utah County in the early 1980s. There's also a, you know, a, a critique about the way that women who are facing abuse in marriage are treated by church leaders or church leaders uh, that where, you know, a woman who is uh, being physically abused is encouraged to try to work things out with her husband. I, I don't think that that's too unrealistic. Sadly, I think we've seen plenty of accounts from women who say that they experience that same thing. Um, and I think the church is trying to a adopt a, a more uh, a more productive and helpful um, uh, approach to those issues. But again, you know, the, this show, I, it's not as if I came to this show thinking that there's nothing wrong with, with, with anything in Mormon culture or Mormon history. Uh, it's just that when, when a show sets out with such an antagonistic thesis and kind of makes no effort to capture the nuance or, you know, um, the the joy even in lived religion uh next to the challenges and problems with it uh it, it means that there's really not much much point in kind of engaging with its critiques yeah i think yeah, I, I i think that's really well put mckay and i think there are other elements too uh, again that are worth talking about the the kind of um social death that can accompany a loss of faith uh, and excommunication. What what does that mean? Again, I think it's overplayed uh, in 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 the show, but it's real, uh, and uh, and it still exists in the 21st century, let alone the 1980s, um, especially in very tight knit, uh, concentrated Mormon communities like Utah County. Um, you know, uh, and and so you know the the ongoing relationship with fundamentalism. Uh, what what does it mean? to have these texts that still say things that we no longer practice. Uh, our scriptures still have polygamy in there. You know, that there's a lot of violence in those, uh, in, in the scriptures. So what does it mean to, to say that these are our scriptures? Um, uh, and what, what does it mean to take scripture seriously, uh, but then read it selectively? Uh, and what does it mean for a tradition to change over time? So, I mean, these are all like really important questions, really important questions that, that we have to grapple with. Uh, and so I, I think even if, um, if I wish the show would have done it a little more elegantly and, and generously, uh, I, I still think that, that we can uh, take up the charge to be serious about these kinds of issues within our community that we need to address. As much as it was difficult to see myself in this 1980s narrative because these people don't act and talk like me that it, I, I think Dustin Lance Black didn't spend enough time in the church actually I think he his wife his, his mother left when he was fairly young I think and he didn't have any additional engagement and so he missed like he 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 clearly was unfamiliar with culture here but I do recognize um uh, the patriarchy was much stronger uh, in the 1980s than, than, I could, than you could argue it is today. And, but there are still uh, remnants of probably unhealthy patriarchy uh, in the church. And when you see it played out on the screen like this, it's, it's a little bit of a, uh, a wake up call maybe. It's a, it, 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 can, it could be revealing to us in some sense. Comments on that? Yeah, no question. I mean, we, we have three men on this podcast, so we, <laughs> we're probably a little reluctant to try to speak for the experiences of women in the church. Um, but right, I mean, th that's, I, I think there, that there's no question that um, there's still a lot of work we have to do to address the, and I guess I'll speak as a Mormon man here, uh, the, the inherent, um, you know, privileges that a lot of men in our church feel that they have, maybe even uh, against what church leaders have said, but have kind of intuited that they have this privileged place in the hierarchy and therefore that should manifest in various ways at home. I, you know, I hear about these struggles all the time and uh, among my Latter-day Saint friends. And I think that, you know, again, there's been a lot of progress made um, and I, I think there will continue to be progress made. I think that the way that progress gets made is by having those difficult conversations in a in the most generous spirit possible. 
uh, probably not going to be kicked off by, you know, such a, a thoroughly antagonistic TV show as yeah. Under the Banner of Heaven. But I do think that uh, the, the show, um, <laughs> even if almost accidentally, stumbles upon some pretty serious, uh, you know, issues that we we as Mormons are talking about. Though, again, one thing I will say that came up in my conversations with non-Mormons who watched the show, they would say, you know, was it... Um, was it hard seeing stuff like this brought up like in, in your TV in this show? Like, were these things that you don't really talk about? And I would say, and I would kind of respond, um, you know, at least in my circles, we talk about this stuff all the time. <laughs> it's not, it, 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 there's this narrative in the show and that Dustin Lance Black has leaned on pretty aggressively in the promotion of the show that he's unearthing all these secrets about Mormonism and uh, that that no Mormons really ever talk about or have heard about or or are willing to discuss. They've been excised from the BYU library. That's yeah, brought up several times. It right. literally says that multiple <laughs> times in the show. And that, first of all, just as a matter of fact, that, that that's not true. But also, you know, maybe that was more true 40 years ago when the show was set. Uh, and when Dustin Lance Black was, you know, apparently in the church, uh, that is just not really the case at all today. In my in my experience, there I'm sure are some some Latter Day Saints who are much uh, less informed about its, you know, the faith's history and more uh, hesitant to talk about the more difficult aspects of Mormon culture. But in my experience, all of this stuff is being endlessly litigated on social media in my own friend groups. Um, you know, Mormons, uh, you know, Mormonism is at a moment where there's a lot of introspection and debate going on. Um, and I don't think this this show particularly captured it, but it, it is it is happening. Why are we so you? Uh, oh, sorry, McKay, just why are we so uniquely vulnerable to attack? I, I just I, you don't see other phase faiths. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm missing something, but I'm aware that there are this is a this is one of a series of attacks on on um, our faith and we're supposed to just uh, smile and, and have a, I, and I, I suppose we actually do this I suppose we take it well we take a punch we get up and smile and say hey we're, we're still here and guess what we you know we're, we're good people but yeah, yeah what is I that? mean you know I don't want to overstate that we're how uniquely vulnerable we are but I do think that we respond in a unique way to stuff like this in that we have conditioned ourselves to be good sports about everything all the time, right? The Book of Mormon musical ridicules uh, our church and our faith and the church takes out ads in the playbill that are kind of playful and good natured. And everybody I knew in the church at the time loved that. They were like, oh, what? This is su such savvy PR. We look so good. We can take a joke. We're, you know, this is great. Um, and I, I don't, you know, I, I should distinguish between the Book of Mormon musical, which kind of makes fun of Mormonism and this show, which is, I think, much more hostile. Um, but, you know, I think that we um, have a desire to uh, be respectable and to be seen as part of, uh, you know, the mainstream. It goes back to a history of Mormonism trying to assimilate uh, into a country that often views it with suspicion. Um, but we we have we I think we are uniquely good sports about stuff like this and uh, you know at least institutionally um, and because of that it makes it all the easier to uh, to to target us. The other thing though is that there are very very few members of the church in Hollywood, right? Working in Hollywood at any level, there are very few members of the church working in the national media at any level. I can say that as as somebody who works in the national media, that there isn't enough of a Mormon present presence in America's elite cultural institutions to make their, you know, to push back on this stuff and to create some kind of social cost to attacking Mormonism. And because of that, it just keeps happening, right? Um, the, the, there are not the same concerns about Mormon representation uh, as there are for other groups that I think are more represented behind the scenes in these cultural institutions. Yeah, I mean, the you know, Mormons represent less than one active Latter-day Saints represent, you know, 1% or less of the U.S. population uh, and, and, you know, overrepresented in middle America, 
uh, especially in the Intermountain West, but not on the coast. Uh, they're so culturally influential. Uh, and, and the fact of the matter is, too, that the Mormons have power. Uh, it's, it's concentrated in, in places like Utah, um, but Mormons are overrepresented in Congress, overrepresented in other uh, uh, elements of American society. So there's a sense of, so that it's a tiny minority, but, but has, uh, or at least in, in some real ways, has real power in certain areas, um, especially Utah, uh, but is seen to have more power uh, than, than maybe it does in other places. So therefore is, um, is subject to, to critique. Um, it, 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 you know, Mormons are not seen, I think, as powerless victims. Um, uh, they're, they're seen, uh, we are seen as wielding power sometimes um, to, uh, against others, uh, the LGBTQ community, women, racial minorities within our history. So, so that then, you know, so, so that's part of the narrative too, is like, hey, let's turn the gaze the other way around um, and, and actually shine the light on, on this tradition. Okay, one I last say it, it, No, it's just, it's funny. The responses to the piece that I wrote um, were really sharply divided between people who live in or who have spent a lot of time in Utah versus those who haven't, mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of people who are from Utah or live in Utah thought my my even description of Mormonism as a uh, minority religious faith, uh, they found that kind of laughable or ridiculous because the context in which they grew up, Mormons were the dominant you know faith. They they controlled every power structure. That was the context they were growing up in. Uh, for people like me who grew up in Massachusetts and, you know, um, have not spent much of my life in Utah, I did go to BYU, um, it, it, you know, I think my experience is a lot closer to other, you know, small religious groups in, in America. And so I, I, I recognize that the, the, your experience uh, with stuff like this is probably shaped by whether you grew up in a predominantly Latter-day Saint community or not. Right. Okay, well, let's, let's, let's close. I have one, one question for Patrick, and this is going to be difficult to answer uh, succinctly, I'm sure, but we are immersed in, this, in the study of the Old Testament as a church now, which is full of uh, violence, much of it attributed to God's command. Um, God is uh, mighty in battle. Uh, he's, I think the psalm refers to the Lord of hosts. Yes. Uh, so when, when that's, when this becomes a topic of conversation in our congregations, uh, is there a is there a way to is there a way to push back on that narrative as being? I, I guess what I'm what I would ask you, Patrick, is when that comes up, do you ever weigh in on the side of a God who probably does not uh, require or command the slaughter of uh, of hosts of people? Yeah, so there's a one word answer to that, and it is Jesus. Uh, and, you know, so th this, it does require a lot longer than we have right here. Uh, but um, we are, in, in, in my short answer to this is we're the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter day Saints. And so we believe that God uh, has revealed himself in the flesh. Uh, in the, the person and character and atonement of Jesus Christ, uh, who was completely nonviolent, that that's the lens through which we have to view all of our history and theology and scripture and ethics. You know, what manner of men ought you to be, even as I am, like Jesus. Um, and so Jesus is the critique of Old Testament violence and Book of Mormon violence uh, and Lafferty violence. That's a good place to end. Thank you. Appreciate that. McKay, we will link to your um, your piece in uh, our show notes, but go to the Atlantic and uh, and you can find McKay's fine piece and other other uh, things that he's written. Uh, Patrick wrote a wonderful book on uh, on peace and violence that we've uh, we've had you as a guest on the podcast before to talk about that. We'll also link to that. 
All right. Thanks so much for listening. We really hope that you enjoyed this conversation. And a big thanks to McKay and Patrick and to Bill for coming on the podcast. If Faith Matters content is resonating with you and you get the chance, we would love for you to leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or whatever platform you listen on. We read all of the reviews and it really helps us to get the word out about Faith Matters and we appreciate the support. Thanks again for listening. And remember, you can check out more at faithmatters.org.